You're tuned in to the Living Hero Podcast at livinghero.com. Welcome to Living Hero. I'm Jari Chevalier, and our program today brings you an interview with clinical psychologist and best-selling author, Dr. Martha Stout. For 26 years, she served as a psychology instructor in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and also taught at the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology, Wellesley College, the New School for Social Research, and the National Institute of Mental Health. Dr. Stout has worked at Massachusetts General Hospital and McLean Psychiatric Hospital. She is author of The Mask of Sanity, The Paranoia Switch, and The Sociopath Next Door, The Ruthless Versus the Rest of Us, a national bestseller and winner of a Books for a Better Life Award. I am so pleased to have you listen in to this conversation. It's not easy to see distinct lines between the character structures ascribed to narcissism, sociopathy, and psychopathy. Are they different disorders? How do you think about the distinctions, and what specifically is sociopathy? Sociopathy and psychopathy, to my mind, are interchangeable. Usually in the popular mind, psychopathy refers to violence, uh, Ted Bundy and the people we've all heard about who become violent and probably serial killers. And I used the word sociopathy in the sociopath next door to try to get away from that and to indicate to people that most people without a conscience are never violent. The difference between sociopathy and narcissism is even more difficult for people to grasp. A clinical narcissist can do at least as much damage socially as a clinical sociopath. But formally, narcissism is the absence of empathy, and sociopathy is the absence of conscience. Narcissism is sort of half of what sociopathy is. The narcissist has feelings, can love, which is a major difference, but it cannot experience or interpret other people's feelings. And this can be very damaging, particularly in a a close relationship, because there's no real emotional exchange. For that person, it's, it's as if you were speaking some of the language that he didn't understand, but thinks that he does understand. Sociopathy is simply not caring, not being able to love or have the tender emotions, or appreciate the tender. It's 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 all of that, and I think it's very clear to people how damaging that can be. It's a little bit less clear to people how damaging the narcissist can be, and so they tend to think of that person as as sociopathic. But in fact, that's not the case. Narcissists tend to be in considerable uh, psychological pain, and uh, they do come to therapy. They do want help, although they don't really understand what's wrong. Whereas the sociopath doesn't feel that there's anything at all wrong with him, uh, and unless court referred, is never going to show up in therapy. I wonder if there's a, a good deal of neuroscientific research going on. There's more and more, but uh, still not nearly so much as I think there will be. Particularly with sociopathy, we found some very interesting differences between the sociopathic brain uh, and the normal brain that have to do with how emotion is processed or not processed. You know, you and I, if when we hear emotional words like love, uh, mother anger, those kinds of things, those process in our brains more instantaneously than non-emotional words like lamp and uh, and car and so forth. Sociopaths, the brain reaction is the same regardless of the emotional content of the word that's presented or the concept that's presented, which leads us to think that there is a disruption in the part of the brain that processes emotion, that there, there is, in fact, a brain substrate to the behavior that we see. The sociopath is not just unwilling, but unable to process emotion, receive and process it. And this is a profound difference. I mean, most of us uh, emotions, emotions take priority. Emotions can compromise our intellectual function. But for a sociopath, trying to figure out emotion is sort of like trying to figure out a calculus program. 
it has no particular valence or or importance to the person, uh, and it must be figured out logically. Very important to keep in mind because it seems that if there really is this complete incapacity, that it is, you know, it's a it's a disability of the brain. It's a disability uh, of the brain. It is perhaps unique in that it's a disability that, that seems to cause no particular pain to the person who has it. it. tends to be quite invisible most of the time. And it isn't something that we can think of generally as a disability, and people will argue about what it is. Is it a moral difference? In my opinion, particularly since there is this apparent brain involvement, those of us who are normal, who do not have this disability, are going to have to find some humane way to deal with it, which is a difficult thing to say to someone who's just been targeted by a sociopath. But on a societal level, I think that remains true, that we're going to have to start not only dealing with this problem, but finding some way to deal with it that befits our emotional status. Well, let's talk now about the effects of sociopathy on society and the prevalence of sociopathy in the United States and elsewhere. Would you talk about the research behind your statement in uh, The Sociopath Next Door that one in 25 people is likely to be a sociopath? Yes. Well, that 4% figure uh, came from a meta-analysis that I did of the available research, which at that time, and still, is, is not very plentiful. It's difficult to know how to mix the research studies and come up with anything that's meaningful because a lot of the research is done only on prison populations or only on men and and so forth. So I had to find a number of studies from a number of different countries and figure out how they were done, who their subjects were, and in the end came out with what I thought was a startling 4% and I assumed, actually, when I published The Sociopath Next Door, that there was going to be an outcry from my fellow psychologists and from clinicians in general saying that this was way too high a figure. In point of fact, every single person who's involved in mental health that I've heard comment on it has said that they feel that the figure is too low. That surprised me. There are people who will assert that they think it's too Hi. But all of these people uh, are not involved in mental health. It's, it's very interesting that those who have some occasion to see this disorder up close and personal feel that 4% while high may not actually be a, a high enough report. And I think this goes back to how invisible sociopathy is for all of us, even mental health professionals. It's very difficult to see because one of the fundamental parts of it is deception, is looking normal. And a bright sociopath, even even one of just normal intelligence, can go far in appearing normal. It turns out that uh, the the emotions and how those are expressed and how to read emotions and so forth is a kind of language that's easier to learn than Portuguese or Russian or, or whatever, that it's, uh, it's not all that difficult. It's acting that the sociopath excels at. Most really talented actors are working with emotion. They have to be extremely, extremely uh, sensitive to that and, and, and intelligent about uh, those kinds of things. An actor might perhaps be narcissistic, but is extremely unlikely actually to be sociopathic, one uh, who's really good. Having said that, uh, sociopaths even sometimes study acting techniques you know, how to produce uh, crocodile tears at will, uh, that kind of thing, trying to read faces. Do you think that a deeper understanding of sociopathy can really contribute to solving some of the world's problems? And if you do, would you say how? Well, just for starters, I think that understanding this this problem creates an entire paradigm shift in the way we view human nature. You know, particularly in the West, uh, we think of human beings as a group of beings that 
all possess the ability to love somewhere inside and who therefore all possess the capacity for conscience at some level. Uh, and then another part of that is the, the feeling that under the wrong circumstances we could all be a uh, Nazi prison guard, for example. And to understand that this may not be true, that in fact it's the case that 4% of us can't love and don't have conscience, and therefore quite possibly true that a lot of the things we attribute to normal human nature, uh, some of the egregious things that we attribute to it, um, may not be right. It's hard to imagine how much of a change that would make societally, culturally, if people could really grasp that on a more sort of concrete level. Sociopaths, as I say, they're not always violent, and they certainly are not always at the lower levels of society. And, in fact, a very intelligent sociopath can, at first, probably go uh, faster and higher uh, than a lot of normal people. You know, Try to imagine what you could do uh, if you had absolute no conscience and it didn't care about whom you hurt or what you hurt and you had no limits at all to what you could think of to promote yourself. It's first hard to think about, but when you can get your head around it, you realize that it would be a great advantage in some ways not to be emotionally accountable for what you do. They are often at very high levels, particularly um in positions and professions that involve control. These are easier for, to reach for sociopaths and more appealing. If you take emotion away from the brain, the only thing that's really left for the person is a desire to win, to be in control. So if we understood sociopathy better, I think that there are some people who are in leadership in various capacities whom we wouldn't trust as much we would be able to see through some things a little bit better. Also, just on the level of violence, usually it's typical to hear the neighbors and the family interviewed after a serial killer is caught, for example, and the typical response is, you know, I never ever would have dreamed that this person could be capable of such a thing, it seems. And the press will talk about how, you know, it could be the boy next door, the girl next door. Well, I think that if we were more familiar with sociopathy and what it looks like on a day-to-day -day basis, that we wouldn't be so surprised. And perhaps we might even be able to help ourselves a little bit better before the fact. You know, this is 4% sociopaths, but that does not even touch how widespread an influence 4% can actually have when they ha may have so many people that they're hurting and so many people who are protecting them. Yes, and so many people who are following them. Absolutely. Unfortunately, denial is a part of normal human nature. Uh, and it's hard when you've invested a lot of your own emotion and time and so forth with a person uh, to believe that they may be so disabled that they really cannot love. It's difficult to look at a person who has said that he or she loves you. It's, it's difficult to say, well, this is not true. This person cannot love. Oftentimes people will spend many years, and I include mental health professionals in this because it's, it's a very difficult thing for all of us to see, spend sometimes years or decades being involved with someone who is controlling them, draining their life away, and pretending to love acting and doing that only. And then also in terms of the great effect that 4% can have, that great effect is why I mentioned the Milgram study in the book to show that another part apparently of normal human nature is to obey an authority figure pretty much without question. Something like 66% of us will uh, do what an authority figure tells us to do, a perceived authority, without questioning it. Well, now, what a wonderful feature of human nature for, uh, for a sociopath. Unless somehow we are able to see through this, there will always be a large number of people who are following someone whose only goal is to control and to win. 
Uh, some people have asked me, you know, would there be fewer wars, for example? And yes, I think there would be fewer wars. Fewer wars on, on the earth if we could understand and contain sociopathy and not go along with sociopathic leaders because so many wars follow the same pattern of pumping up the populace with a sense of honor and patriotism and doing the right thing and dehumanizing the enemy. And that pattern is, is something that unfortunately is relatively easy to set in motion. What is power if not uh, controlling other countries, if not controlling some part of the earth? So I think that the existence of 4% without conscience has and has always had an enormous influence on us. If it were just 4% of people, it wouldn't be a non-problem, but it certainly would not have the impact that it does. How does a sociopath think? What is it like to be a sociopath? It is a very difficult thing for me to do, for other people to do, because we, in general, have no empathy with the sociopath. Most of us can imagine what it's like to be uh, depressed, for example, because we've all been blue from time to time. We can imagine, we can even imagine schizophrenia or psychosis, because at the very least, we're that way in our dreams. You know, we can imagine what that must be like. To have no conscience is something that is extremely difficult to get your head around, extremely difficult to imagine. Uh, and so we imagine it in ways typically that aren't right. Uh, and one of the things that we imagine is that it, it would be a lot of violence. Well, not necessarily. I mean, bloodlust is, is a separate thing in all of us from whether or not one has conscience. It's the desire to control that gets left. The burning desire to control and to win life as a chess game. Uh, nothing wrong with chess, but it's a game. And all of life comes down to that for, for the sociopath. And the intelligent sociopath, the professional sociopath, may be extremely good at that. If, uh, somebody is not in a position to cause a war or, or do something on a grander scale, then where they are in their lives, in their society, will be where they try to make people jump. They're not all professionals, so sometimes making people jump has to occur at a somewhat lower level. I think I mentioned child abuse. In the book, I talk about a, a man who steals stamps from the post office because he likes to go and watch the police come in the morning and watch all this havoc that he's created. Even though he's been jailed multiple times for the same thing, and he's pretty sure he's going to get caught uh, when, he, when he does this, when he, when he does the theft, that's not so relevant as being able to see people jump. It's like the old children's game of sending a pizza, you know, to somebody's house who, who didn't order it. And, you know what I mean? It's, it's so immature. Which gives kids a sense of, of power, mm. you know, being able to get one over on someone, usually adults, you yeah. know. Now, going back to how to deal with this type of person in one's life and in one's society, what would you have us do? What would you suggest? And, and would you share the story you shared in the book about the Inuit? Um, yes, uh, this is, this is anthropology rather than psychology, but, um, uh, the, uh, traditional Inuit, and that I assume does not still go on, but the traditional way, Inuit way of dealing with the sociopath, um, was to get the entire village, or all the males anyway, in the village, uh, to get together and basically push that person off the ice. Uh, in other words, uh, you get rid of the sociopath by literally get, getting rid of the sociopath. Um, and what's also interesting uh, to me is that uh, wolves, wolves which rely very much on their pack, uh, very social creatures, uh, a mother wolf, if she perceives that one of her cubs is not social, is sociopathic, basically has no... Uh, no tendency to want to defer to or cooperate with the others, she will often kill that cub. 
before it even has a chance to grow up and be and behave in a sociopathic way there you know there's there's there are ways in which nature in older societies there are ways that they had to deal with this kind of problem we obviously can't do that and don't believe we want to do that even if we could identify well we try to do it with the death penalty but let let's assume we we don't want to do that what do you suggest people do as individuals kind of having their eyes open in their own lives in their workplaces in their personal lives in their families and then to spread that out to the larger scale picture that we're all involved in um what would you suggest well First of all, I, I mean, I think that if we can deal with it on an individual basis, that we'll have a much better chance of dealing with it on the larger societal basis. Uh, but what I first suggest to people, if it's possible, is simply to avoid. You know, do not get enmeshed with, do not join the game. And, uh, you know, one of the things that sociopaths will do is they'll try to make us pity them. Uh, and don't do that. Save your pity for... Um, for people who deserve it, and don't feel that you have to be overly polite. Uh, but but basically, if you can get away, if you can avoid, then then please do that, because there's no sense in hanging around because the situation isn't going to change. There's no known cure for sociopathy, and you certainly are not going to change the person. For his own reasons, he may go to therapy to please you, but... He's not going to change. So, you know, do not make that your mission. Just get away if you possibly can. Of course, there are people who can't get away. There, there are people who need that job where the boss or a co-worker is sociopathic. There are people, unfortunately, whose own children are behaving in a sociopathic way, and as they get older, uh, start to show the more overt signs of of sociopathy, I would class those as people who effectively can't get away. And that is an amazingly tough situation, particularly if you're uh, the parent. And so let's take it first to say you have a co-worker who's manipulating you and who is turning people against you, loves to see you jump, has no qualms at all about lying, stealing, whatever, in order to do this. The temptation is to take that on yourself at first and figure you must be doing something wrong. After you've figured out that you've been targeted by someone who's doing this, I think the temptation is to scream and yell and uh, try to get uh, other people to see it the way you do. And both of those things uh, tend not to work, (laughs) you know, taking it on yourself or screaming and yelling and campaigning. I think it's much more effective get as much distance as you can and not to campaign but to let people know at those times when it's relevant you know someone mentions something else that the person has done don't keep your mouth shut you know say yes this happened to me and maybe describe the story a superior at work asks you about it then you can say getting Getting an organization free of a sociopath usually works best if there are a number of people who at some level understand the problem, at least understand that this person is not good for the organization. By no means should you try to help this person keep the secret, although uh, he or she may try mightily uh, to get you to keep the secret. Again, I think the pity play comes into action. So, uh, you know, oh, please, I need this job, et cetera, and so forth. Well, that's the way a normal person would react to the idea of having his job taken. That's an act for a sociopath, and so don't waste your pity and don't believe it. I appreciated you saying in the book that the combination of antisocial behavior and the pity play is the closest thing to a mark on the forehead that you're ever going to get in identifying a sociopath. So probably the example that that people can relate to best is of the physically abusive spouse who beats up usually the wife, although not exclusively, on a fairly regular basis. And um, after it's over, 
will attempt the the pity play. Will say, "Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'll never do it again. I have this problem with anger, and you who love me, you must you must help me because it's you know it's it's brutal for me, and I, I when I can't control myself, um, that kind of turning it around into a terrible problem for himself." And encouraging the person to forget that she's just been beaten. And another example in a relationship might be financial. You have a relationship with a sociopath and you discover that this person has, in one way or another, been uh, destroying your finances, has been taking from you uh, financially. If discovered, that can turn into the pity plays. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm so sorry. I thought I'd be able to make that money back, but I was absolutely desperate to get the money, followed by some sad story about why that was true. That shouldn't be believed, but often is believed over and over again, despite, you know, all the evidence to the contrary. It gets believed. And again, people in our culture, really can't understand, don't want to understand, that there are people who have no conscience. And no matter how hard you try, and no matter how much you love them, that is not going to be instilled. And the behavior is not going to change. And in fact, the behavior is fairly predictable. And I think what I say in the book is if if there is someone in your life who is consistently irresponsible and consistently causing you harm or psychological pain and at the same time is doing this pity play to you, at you, the, oh, I'm so sorry, but the reason is, and then, you know, I'm, I'm so depressed or this or that or the other thing. That combination, the irresponsibility and the dishonesty combined with the pity play is the closest that one is going to get to a mark on the forehead. What are the stats on the relationship between sociopathy and addiction? Because that last part where you were talking about the romantic relationships, it just sounded so much like a relationship with drugs and alcohol. First of all, not all addicts are sociopaths, and not all sociopaths are addicts. However, a sociopath is much more likely than another person to be addicted to something, something on the order of of 60-70% of sociopaths are addicted to alcohol or some other substance. Uh, It's as if they're trying to numb themselves from the chronic boredom that they feel, having no emotional life uh, whatsoever. So yes, I think there's good enough statistics that if you want to add to the signs I've already mentioned, if you want to add addiction, then you've come even closer to a 100% diagnosis. Unfortunately, although it's possible for an individual to deal with people using such cues and clues, it isn't possible really for our legal system as it stands now to deal on such a level of soft evidence. And the legal system is the place where sociopaths often win. You know, it's a game. Sociopaths play games easily. It assumes honesty. Sociopaths are not honest. And many of the crimes that sociopaths commit aren't crimes that are on the books. They're not uh, legal crimes. Yeah, they're crimes of the heart. Crimes of the heart, by and large. And uh, even when there's somewhat more than that, it's difficult to prove it or to accuse the person of something that is actionable in a court of law. I'm writing uh, a book right now, as a matter of fact, that deals extensively with that very issue that our legal system is not prepared, in fact, counter-prepared to deal with sociopaths, and that somehow we need to do something about that, too. I want to thank you so very much for your extraordinary dedication to truth-telling through this work that you do, Martha. Thank you for the interview. Special thanks for today's program go to audio engineer Charles de Montebello of CDM Studios, New York. Living Hero is a production of In This Regard, a fiscally sponsored project of Fractured Atlas, which serves as our nonprofit umbrella. We receive funding and in-kind contributions from the Puffin Foundation and from listeners like you. Your contributions are tax-deductible to the full extent of the law. Please help us continue to offer and grow this program. 
to access our archive of interviews, to post your comments, and to help us fund future programs, visit us at livinghero.com. Thanks for listening.